Rotting up back on the streets. Yeah. It's breakfast, breakfast with Bob. Oh! Pancho Bear! Yeah, yeah, brother! <laughs> breakfast with Bob. We are brought to you by Hoka One One Polar Halo Neuroscience Velo Fix. Today's plan, Norma Tech Four Seasons Resort, Hualalai. That's a pretty sweet place. Triathlete Magazine. And we're here at beautiful Huggos on the Rocks. Our next guest, six-time Ironman World Champion. Give it up for Mr. Mark Allen. <laughs> I don't know how you fit 10,000 people in this it's restaurant. Amazing. It's amazing. It is it's unbelievable with all the sand. Incredible. And we, uh, had to get all the... You had to, had to get all the all, all the bouncers here to get a crowd out of the way. But I have to say, they all look good in their Speedos. They do. <laughs> really, really nice. So how fun is it to, it's been how many years since, wait, you retired after 95, so this is old news, coming over here and hanging out and watching. Well, you know, that was, <laughs> I remember those days when I could run real fast, and, but now I, if I can get down and get a cup of coffee in the morning, it's a good day, yep. When, when you see, we had some guys yesterday said, yeah, I did three Ironman in four weeks. I did five this year. I'm going, this is craziness. And the number, amount of events that people are racing, full Ironman, right? They're like two weeks before this race. It, it, how many total Ironman, Ironman races did you do in your career? I did 14, 15 Ironmans in my career, 15, but that was over 15 years. So I did 12 in Kona. Yes. Two at Ironman Japan and one in Ironman Germany. So uh, you can do 15 maybe your, over your lifetime or 20 or whatever it is, but if you're compressing it in two or three years, then you're going to be toast. I sort of spread it out because I love the experience and right. I love each year having that, that race and that goal to look forward to. So. Well, it was sort of a culmination of your season for most of the years. It was this race. But during the season, you were doing Olympic distance. There mm -hmm. really the 70.3 half distance really wasn't that, uh, wasn't, there weren't that many out there at that point. You had the Nice event, which, yeah. which you dominated for years and years. And that was like a six-hour-ish type of race. But this was the long race of the year, not one of seven long races of the year. Right. No, it was, this was the key for the year for me. And it was kind of like, the end this was my new year's eve you know this was the at the end of a cycle i would come here and uh, once this was done then it was like a reset for the whole coming season so october was october was where everything built for so i would start training in january i would do a lot of endurance work and then have nice in june along with an, a half iron man that i would do in sweden many years oh seder yeah, Seder. Uh, and then when I got to the bulk of the, s the, the meat of the summer, that's when I would switch to doing Olympic distance racing. I would cut back on my endurance. Keep your speed. I would, yeah, keep my speed, get my speed, get fresh again, do that high-end intensity work. And then right around the beginning of August, I would do my last Olympic distance race. And then at that point, it's like, okay, I am done trying to be fast. Let me go back to some long stuff. And then so it was perfect because then I would cycle back into Ironman training and it gave me just enough time to then rebuild that endurance in the last part of the summer to come here and then also be in peak condition for Ironman in Kona. And the other thing that, that uh, always blows me away, there's a lot of people here who are already making the plan. If I don't have a great day in Kona, I'm already signed up for Arizona. I'm signed up for Florida, right? And, and they're getting ready for that where you were one of those guys when this race was over, it was put the bike in the garage and you surfed and mm -hmm. really took care of your body and then did a thing called recovery, which I think a lot of our folks have never, don't know how to spell that word. Recovery. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, if you look up, if you Google recovery, my mugshot is right next to it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Along with sleep. Yeah. This is a guy who can sleep. How many, you would, Huddle told me the grip would sleep. 10 to 12 hours a night, and then he would nap another two, three hours. So 15 hours a day, he was comatose. Yeah, I was kind of like a cat, you know. I <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, sleep is, so w especially for me, was so important as far as recovery as, as part of being fresh. Yes. And through the, through the sleep that I got, you know, I felt like my recovery was a just a little bit faster th than a lot of the guys. So when I really f had to dial in and focus my training, I hit more of my key workouts fresh and able to really take advantage of them. You know, if you're cutting back on the amount of sleep that you need, you're not getting enough, your body just doesn't go into that real deep recovery mode. And of course, if you have a job, a family, a life, it may not be realistic to 
get your complete optimal level of sleep, but it's just something for people to keep in the back of their minds. For sure, it was I important for me. And as far as having, you know, those extra races, so like, okay, I'm signed up for Kona. I've made it here, but uh, if I don't have a good race, I want to hopefully right away take that fitness and qualify for next year's uh, Ironman so then people have these uh, other races that they're already signed up for. Right. It's sort of like a, a safety valve that that makes it very difficult for you to actually put everything into this one because it's sort Commits. of like you gotta oh, commit. Okay. I, if it goes bad, then I have that I can go to get back here next year. I never had that. It's like if it goes bad here, I have to live with that experience. I have to to own it, to then r go back home, get distance from it, and then finally ask myself, okay, why did I fall apart? You know, what can I change for next year? As opposed to just saying, oh, I fell apart, let me go to the next one, and, and then hopefully I can have a good race, and then I'll get back here in Kona. So after you win here in 93, you take 94 off. And you, you, know, you, you tried for so long to win this race. You win it in 89, won it 89, 99, won it 93. You said him so quick. 89, <laughs> then 90, <laughs> then 91, 92, 93, which was epic race. You, know, you beat <sighs> Bustos, Pauly Kiru. It was unbelievable. Five was long great. years. Five amazing. Five long years after six years of not winning. <laughs> six years of <laughs> suck. Six years of, oh, my God, my, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in the okay. hospital after 87. <laughs> I had a 13-minute. I can start going back on those. No, we don't want to go there. Okay. So. 90, you take 94 <laughs> off, coming here to watch it. Because you know, you I don't think you'd ever watched it before. Did you learn anything from that? Because you're watching Dave, right, who was racing that year after five years off. Wh what did you take away from watching it, besides it, the fact it's a long-ass day? Yeah, you know, Bob, that was, that's actually a, a great question. In, in 94, I was here. I was watching for the first time. I knew that the following year I would be coming back. And so I, 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 was, I, was, I was just trying to see something that maybe I hadn't seen before. And the biggest thing that I saw is that about 90% of the things that the athletes were nervous about was stuff that they were just making up in their own minds. It, it didn't exist in reality. So all of a sudden I realized, wait, I am looking at myself reflecting in, in all of these athletes. I would come here completely nervous. I'd have these scenarios in my brain that were going around and around and around, things that would never, ever happen. And so when I came back in 95, I just had this... <sighs> It's going to be intense. It will be unpredictable. I cannot control how the day is going to go. But I feel just a little bit more relaxed. And it just gave me this calmness and this flow that I was able to actually go into the race with that I think really kept the energy going throughout the day during moments certainly that were completely impossible and challenging. And so, you know, for those who are going to be doing Ironman here uh, on Saturday or any uh, Ironman anywhere, you know, use those nerves for sure to elevate yourself to the next level. I mean, I if you're not nervous, you're not going to have that race that's any different than what you've done in your training. But we want something different than we've, than we've actually seen in our training. So, you know, use those nerves to elevate, but get them in the right place and realize that, you know what, all of the things that are in my mind that I'm nervous about, probably most of them I am not going to have to deal with. And if I do have to deal with any of them, it's going to be so much easier to do in the race than it is to think about how I'm going to deal with it before the race. So I'm assuming that 94 year you were working for NBC. So you were probably in there when they're doing the interviews with the athletes. Yeah. And so now you're on the other side of it and you're watching people under the bright lights, right? And I'm sure you're probably taking little mental notes going, oh, this guy looks pretty fragile. This guy, did you learn something from watching those interviews? Yeah, you know, watching, watching the guys talk about their races, you can see that each of them, none of them are really telling you what's going on because they're all strategizing. How is this going to be perceived by the other guy that I might have to beat, you know? And so, I, I, you know, when I went into the interviews in 95, I, I just told people how I felt, you know? I said, hey, I have no idea if I can win this thing because I'm 37, I'm trying to win six in a row here, uh, my training's gone pretty darn good. You know, I'll admit that, but uh, I'm here to just see what I can do one more time to see if I can pull one more little thing out of the bag that nobody's ever seen before. Little did I know that it was going to be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and there's a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a risk because you you, if you had left after 93, if you'd retired, you're, you know, you've won your last five, 
But now when you come back in 95, the risk is, what if you don't win? Do you feel like, because you sort of knew this is it, no matter what. But if you don't win, you might go, well, gosh, I sur- certainly want to win my last one. Yeah, that's, that's the slippery slope. <laughs> you come back. <laughs> exactly. So you come back, and now you're, like you said, 37 years old. There's this young Uber cyclist named Thomas Hellriegel who... And people say, well, why didn't you try to stay with him? I mean, this guy was in a different time zone. He was racing the helicopter. He wasn't racing you. He was, he was, he was gone. I, th- I think he had the first motor in the bike that, yes. you know. <laughs> exactly. It started with Thomas Elrigal. And he built, what, 13 minutes, 14 minutes? Thir- 13 and a half. 13 and a half. 13 and a half. So you get off the bike 13 and a half minutes behind. Had you ever been in that type of position before? Absolutely not. That was, that was the biggest gap that anybody had ever faced who was trying to actually win, and, and if I could pull it off, it would be the biggest gap that had ever been closed. But j- just to back up yeah. a moment to what you were saying about me coming in, you know, it, how would it be if I came back and, and didn't win? Would I have come back another time? You know, that's, that's almost that safety valve, like signing up for another race, just in case you don't have a good one. That's great point. You know, and so when I, when I came here in 95, I didn't want that safety valve. I wanted to just be very absolutely clear that, okay, indeed, this is... This is it. Th- doesn't matter win, lose, or draw. N- however, it turns out, this will be my final Ironman, and that th- having that be such a concrete, defined uh, ending, knowing that no matter what happened, it, this would be the end. It actually freed me up to give that little bit extra that I don't think I could have found had I had it in the b- back of my mind, like, uh, well, maybe next year. Yeah, that's a great point. So, so anyway, you know, I had nobody had ever closed that gap to be the champion. And so when I came off the bike, you know, I was, I was thinking, I'm having the worst Ironman of my life. I mean, 13 and a half minutes down, that's the, that's the most anybody had been off the bike ahead of me. I mean, what would you do if you were 13 and a half minutes behind the person that you wanted to beat, right? And your condo's right there. And, <laughs> yeah, and my condo <laughs> was right there. And, you know, I... I I was actually, I came off the bike, and I, s- I kind of broke it down, and I said, all right, I can't make up that. I can't make up 30 seconds a mile, but let me see if I can make up an inch or a, 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 a second every step of the marathon. That was something I could wrap my brain around, and that's what I had to do to try to keep myself engaged. And I got to the top of the first hill on the marathon, and I, you know, there's, there were just thousands of people lining the course and there were three old ladies who were looking right at me cheering and they go go mark go mark go mark ah he doesn't look so good (laughs) and that thought sunk in and And you were like mom (laughs) yeah i i i felt so bad that i i didn't even know if i could finish the race and you know it was it just shows how immediate a thought can affect your race when you're in a race like the iron man when you're in it that late in the game and as you said, my condo was coming up, and I thought, hey, just go down there. <laughs> just, you know, everybody will understand. Five times. Five champion. times. But I, I, then I thought, you know, this, this was a risk to come here. Like you said, you know, I could have easily just not come. But if I come and I lose, that's a big risk because I wouldn't be remembered as Mark Allen, the five-time Ironman champ. I'd be remembered as a guy who came back for one too many. And so I just... You know, I had I had done a lot of work physically, mentally, emotionally to get get ready. You know, my my main mentor, my teacher, Brant Secunda, before I went to came here, he said, "No matter what, it's never over until it's over. Just trust. Call out to the island if you need help. The island will hear you. This race is going to be beyond numbers for you." And I didn't really understand the the intensity or the gravity of that. But in that moment where I thought just go down to the hotel Brant's words came back to me and he and I thought yeah you know what T- I need to take that next step I need to stay engaged I need to just trust that even if I don't win that my life is still going to be precious and and worth living you know it's like am I going to hang my entire existence on whether I win or lose this race and so I just said yeah no matter no matter what even if I have to walk every single step of this marathon I am going to get to that finish line. And it just all of a sudden kind of started to change. I started to make up 30 seconds a mile. And at eight miles to go in the marathon, I was four minutes behind Hellriegel. So, you know, I was making up time, but in a sense it wasn't, <coughs> it wasn't enough because I was still relatively only on pace to catch him at the finish line. Was where, you know, And so, again, I thought... Sprint finish. 
Wah, 37 years yeah. old. They're not good. They're, you know, four minutes back. I'm making up time, but I'm still only going to catch this guy at the finish. And catching a guy who's 13 years younger than you yeah, when good. you're sprinting for the world championship, <laughs> I can tell you who's going to win. <laughs> <laughs> And so that's, that's when I just said, hey, Big Island, help me here. I'm going to give everything I have, but I need something extra. Yeah. The mile after that, I made up 40 seconds. The one after that, a little over 50. The mile after that, I made up a minute and 15 seconds on the guy who had been leading for over six hours. Finally, at mile 23 of the marathon, I came up behind Thomas Hellriegel. I rested. I quieted my mind. I took that last breath, and then I went by him and made the final pass of my Ironman career, and it did hold. He, he stayed with me for just a brief moment, which, you know, it was only a sliver of time, but in Ironman terms, at that point of the game, it felt like he stayed with me for 10 miles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I did go on to win. I, I beat him by two and a half minutes, which is, is really actually, if you look at the... That's <laughs> right. <laughs> And it's not like the guy died. He ran what two fifty six, right? He had a, a great run. And he came back in uh, he came back and eventually in nineteen ninety seven he became the Ironman Triathlon World Champion. Right. So you know it was it was inc an incredible race that day. It set the stage, I think, for him to be an Ironman champion. And for me personally, it was. You know, I, I said it, it, when I started the marathon, a 13 and a half minute deficit. I thought I was having the worst race of my life. But now, if I look back at it, I realize. That was the best Ironman I ever had. Absolutely. Because it was so difficult. And when I came <laughs> here, I, I just kind of asked the island, I said, hey, help me to have one last great race. And I didn't realize that to have that great race, I needed to have it be the most challenging of any that I had ever experienced here. And that's how our greatness comes out. Well, and then you're, you're also dealing with the guy on one shoulder going, the condo's right there, and the <laughs> other guy on the other guy, you can still do this. And finally, you sort of have to tell your mind, shut up, right? You just have to basically say, just, just one step in front of the other. And I think it was a point where Greg Welch, who had won the year before, you, he stopped and stretched, and you passed him. And that gave you a boost. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's not like you've got these two voices, and one's going, there's the condo, just, just go for it. And the other one's going, no, but you can do it. It's more like, there's the condo, there's the condo, there's the condo, you can do it. Stop, quit, just don't do it. And the other guy's going, you can do it. You know, it's hard to hear that other voice when this other one is <laughs> just yelling at you and you're, you have, your, your legs are killing you and it's like you're, you're going like this, but you really need to just, as you said, shut up and listen to the other one that's going, you can do it. You can do it. How special was it when you're, it's the last time. A lot of people say, this is going to be my last one, and then they're back, right? <laughs> liars. <laughs> liars, Those right? liars. <laughs> but to win the last event, and I'm sure there are people offering you appearance fees, come back, come do other races. How hard was it to, wa to walk away? It was absolutely the easiest thing I've ever done. <laughs> you, you knew. I, I knew, and I, you know, uh, during my career, I had one of my underlying g goals or underlying principles was I said I want to retire from the sport uninjured, not burned out, healthy, and with energy to carry on for the rest of my life. Because I'd seen too many um, world-class athletes, yep. runners, cyclists, triathletes who went too many years, and all of a sudden their body starts to break down, and then all of a sudden they don't have the performance that they want to go out on, and then it becomes this thing that's almost frustrating for them because they're not accomplishing what they hope to. And I thought, I want to go out in a different way. And so, like I said, I knew this would be my last one. And I don't know, it was much easier to go out with the win than <laughs> it had yeah, probably than, than it had I got second place, so I don't even want to figure out if I could have done it as, as seamlessly. But... No, for me, it's, it's been perfect. It's so great because I was able to exit the sport kind of in a way that I had envisioned that I could. And, I, you know, I wasn't injured. I wasn't burned out. I've had energy s s all these years since then. And now I can just translate those experiences and give it back to the people I coach through my coaching, coming to Ironman, talking to, you know, 10,000 people in the restaurant in here. In Speedos. Impacting oh, all of you. It's amazing. Yeah, I'm going to dress oh, you differently yeah, the next yeah, time. Yeah, but real, yeah. Love it. How about a round of applause? Six-time Ironman world champion, <laughs> the great Mark Allen. 10,000 people going crazy. <laughs> Love it. Well, listen, now I'm back on my feet. Just a man and his will to survive. 
Woo. on breakfast with Bob. Yeah, Pancho. Oh.